10 years in Chicago, so I feel like I've served my time outside of Oregon. Or very glad to be back. We've been back for about eight years. So um, at Tillamook, I have responsibility for the consumer insights function, so all things that you would typically uh, associate with the consumer insights function, research, data, um, consumer interviews, and so forth. And I also have, um, as a part of my scope of responsibility, the green ring on the Oregon coast, and then the Tillamook market at the PDX airport, we just opened last July. So um, a lot of tourism uh, kind of plugs, as well as a uh, you know, beloved Oregon brand. Tillamook cheese, Tillamook ice cream, and so forth. So since 1909, um, we've been offering uh, great dairy products uh, from Oregon, um, now nationwide. So yeah, excited to be here. Uh, Matt Olsofsky, uh, co-founder of Take Two Foods, based here in Portland, Oregon. I'm actually not a, a native Portlandier. Um, <laughs> it was interesting, though. My first memory of, of coming to Oregon is at the grocery store. I picked up this pint of Tillamook ice cream. Uh, toasted coconut fudge, and it was absolutely delicious. So that was really my first experience with some of the, the amazing Oregon food products uh, that that we all love and enjoy. Um, Take Two Foods. Uh, I'm operations and also the mad scientist behind you know new product development. Uh, Take Two Foods. Uh, we're really our mission is about creating second chances for people's health and the planet. We've created the world's first barley milk, which is made from upcycled brewer's grains that are a byproduct of the beer brewing process. Uh, we craft that um, into delicious plant-based dairy alternatives. Um, you know, my career didn't start in food at all. Uh, my background's in engineering and science. I worked in pharmaceuticals for 10 years on making medicine and, and you know, making, um, bringing those to market. Uh, about 10 years into it, I, I had this soul searching of you know, what I want to do the next phase of my career. I think it's a pretty common theme uh, for most people. And uh, I went back to school, I studied business, I studied entrepreneurship, uh, and when I came out, I actually landed at uh, the opposite of a startup, which is Anheuser-Busch InBev, which is the world's largest beer company. Uh, but that was fortunate, though, because that's where I got introduced to spent grain. So each year, billions of pounds, with a B, billions of pounds of spent grain are produced as a byproduct of beer brewing. Um, whereas the sugar and starch can go to make beer, uh, what was left over was fiber and protein. And it would go to waste. Uh, it would either go to maybe animal agriculture as feed, sometimes it went to landfill, uh, which is really unfortunate because it's so nutritious. It, it can serve a greater purpose in the food system where there's already so much inefficiency and waste. And so that's where you know, my co-founder and I met up and figured out you know, how can we save the grain? How can, how can we get this as a new ingredient? And how can we get these products to consumers in a compelling way uh, to meet their needs? And so it's just been an interesting story of, of innovation and, uh, and, and mission and purpose. And just super excited to be here with Tillamook, which is you know, such a, a storied and amazing company with a history of producing great products. So really excited about our conversation today. Yeah, it's interesting when Mitch reached out and you know proposed this pairing. I thought, wait, what are we doing here? <laughs> We've got you know a hundred and you know plus year old dairy company um, paired with a dairy alt um, company. But it's been so awesome, you know, getting to know you, Matt, and getting to know what Take Two is all about, and finding more similarities, I think, than differences um, in what we're trying to do, how our relationships with consumers um, are evolving. So. Um, yeah, it felt like kind of rich territory for us to explore. I know we've had a good time uh, prepping and looking forward to, to chatting here. So, Awesome. Well, I think let's kick it off. Um, you know, we were already talking about some of the, the science and technology on, on the Take Two side, but I think from a Tillamook side, like, you know, what is your approach on innovation and forward looking, not only with the new products for consumers, but also with, you know, how do we embed sustainability into those, into those new products as well? Yeah, it's something, I mean, we think about a lot and some when I started at Tillamook my boss said you know cheese great this is you know this is where we're headed not a lot of innovation uh, may come to mind when you think of cheese but we're at such an interesting point in history such an interesting point um, kind of in what consumers are looking to food companies in particular to provide for them so you know our approach to innovation has really been um, consumer inspired so as the title of our talk um, is sort of centered around you know, you don't want to be on this sort of spectrum of consumer controlled, right? So asking consumers for permission to do things, letting them sort of direct um, where you need to take um, your company, your brand. You also don't want to be consumer oblivious. So, you know, consumers don't know what they want. They don't have any idea. This is what we're going to bring to market. 
you're going to have maybe a really killer product, but it's going to miss the mark uh, in some ways. So we really try to strike that balance of being consumer informed, consumer inspired um, in our innovation, um, as well as you know our marketing and kind of our, our ethos of how we um, exist in the market. So you know ways that comes to life is with regard to sustainability um, and our stewardship practices. You know we have six uh, stakeholders in our stewardship stewardship charter. Um, you know, things around the ecosystem, um, thriving farms, healthful cows, enriched communi uh, communities, uh, uh, great employee um, relations. But consumers are one of those key stakeholders um, in our stewardship charter. And what that really means is they might not be asking um, for, you know, this particular um, kind of evolution in our product to make things more sustainable or make things more, um, you know, uh, uh, palatable for them and kind of what their their life aspirations are but we need to intuit what those tension points are um, how we can resolve something that they didn't even ask for um, we talk a lot about the Henry Ford quote of uh, if you'd ask consumers what they wanted they would have said faster horses um, so we don't ask consumers what they want um, we don't um, say you know uh, uh, hey, give us permission to do this. We don't, we don't do that. That would be consumer controlled. Um, but we want to make sure that we understand kind of what those, those core values are and how we can show up um, with, you know, uh, pushing the envelope a bit, but not too far that it's, that it's out of reach. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting kind of balancing act. Yeah. Uh, on the take two side, um, you know, it, innovation is at the heart of our company, right? And then creating compelling products that are aligned with our, our mission and vision is the challenge. But I think what's interesting, I think you said palatable and, you know, with plant-based food, that word comes up a lot for some reason. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of products, the alternatives, dairy alternatives leave a lot to be desired, right? Maybe they don't taste like traditional dairy. Maybe it's not the same nutrition. Uh, or, or function, right? If you if you put a, a milk into your coffee, you don't expect it to curdle, right? And so I and I think a lot of year for a long a lot of time, people, you know, sort of dealt with it, right? Because it, it was the best option at the time. And you know, you go back 20 years, there's almond milk, right? It's been around for a while. Portland, you know, the the vegan vegetarian community here is huge, um, but at Take Two, you know, we thought we could do better. We thought we could make a more sustainable milk, where the product in and of itself is inherently sustainable, right? There, there's no dichotomy, um, you know, where, you know, for us, I guess another way to say it, it's never about putting another product on the shelf. There's a lot of products out there. So there's a lot of amazing products out there. And so tr create something that's compelling and differentiated for the consumer is a must. Tastes great is a must. Nutritious is people, it's food, right? It needs to be nutritious. And so innovation is really at the heart of what we can do. And I think for me, what's really been the en enabler you know, what's different today than five years ago or 10 years ago? Why are we having this conversation now? Why, why is plant-based on everything when we go to the store or read a news article? And the reality is, is the techne technology is changing. The, the technology to, you know, bring out the best of food and food ingredients to, to change, you know, some of the, the techniques uh, and ways to bring those to market have, have really changed the landscape. Um, and, and created opportunities to really th start forward thinking when it comes to sustainability. Um, you know, a lot of times when we talk sustainability, they talk about nonlinear thinking or circular, circularity, circular economies. Um, but, uh, you know, Carrie, as you're saying, that, that's not, you need more than one company to do it. It's, it's a community effort. You need consumer adoption. You need consumer education. Um, and, that, and that's universal. And so as we, we start talking about new products and what we're going to bring to market next week or next year. Um, it's, it's not cradle to grave anymore. It's cradle to grave to cradle, right? Um, I, we had an interesting side conversation is, you know, I, I can feel good about, you know, creating a product that has compostable or recyclable or post-consumer content um, materials. But at the end of the day, if, if the consumer just still unwraps it and throws it away and it goes into landfill, the question is, have we, have we really moved the needle? Are we really making the world a better place? Like, so I think that's just an interesting, an interesting challenge, right? Because it, it, it's going to take a community and it's going to take a lot of education in order to, to, to truly realize our sustainability ambitions. Yeah, and I think it was a couple of things that sparked for me of, you know, so we have cheese that's wrapped in plastic. Um, and, you know, we hear from consumers, no, less plastic, less plastic, and we're all about that and want to make sure that, you know, as we're thinking about innovation, um, that we're addressing those needs. 
to what you said, Matt, if, you know, if we find the world's most sustainable package um, to safely deliver our product to market, but then consumers wrap it in saran wrap when it gets home, um, well, then we've, we've missed the mark, right? We have done nothing um, kind of net-net um, on this kind of objective that we're, um, that we're marching towards. So how do we, back to this sort of consumer-inspired, um, consumer-informed kind of space, really understand the tensions? What are we trying to solve for um, once it's in the home? What's a full life cycle analysis um, to make sure, you know, from cradle to grave to cradle, um, what that kind of holistic um, impact is, can be, um, and kind of opportunities there. So yeah, it's uh, no shortage of things to work on, as we <laughs> often say. So yeah. something you said, though, I was interested on, um, you know, new product, bringing something to market that's disruptive. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of selfishly, um, I'm curious where you find that kind of uh, disruptive inspiration. Um, is there something that, you know, has really been uh, impactful in, um, in the Take Two journey? Um, that is a great question. I didn't mean to do a stump either. <laughs> no, no, no. I um, I live and breathe this every day. Uh, you know, the, the inspiration, uh, you know, my co-founder, Jarek, and myself, you know, we have different backgrounds. He's been an athlete and vegan for a better part of a decade. I grew up in the Midwest. And so even from a food perspective, we always had difference of opinion of, of what is truly healthy. What are our guardrails? Uh, what should we be bringing to the market that's, that's unique and compelling? Um, so a lot of the times the inspiration actually just comes from being consumers in the space, right? You know, the, when I bring a product home and I, I try it and it leaves me, you know, un, unhappy, right? It, it, it didn't taste great. It didn't work the way I thought it would. And, you know, as a consumer, I'm like, this is, this is tough. Like food's expensive and it's getting more expensive. And this, to spend $5 on a product that may or may not work is kind of a, an expensive hobby, right? Um, and, and consumers deserve better. And so, you know, for inspiration, you know, we, we have our own insights as consumers. Um, I think a lot of it, though, where the rubber meets the road is, how do we start thinking outside of our walls, right? And actually get real feedback from the rest of the community, from the rest of the, uh, the consumers out there. Um, because I think, Carrie, as you said earlier, you know, we can make the most delicious, nutritious, sustainable product on earth, but if people don't know to ask about it, they don't know it exists, they can't find it on the shelves, then you, you don't really, you don't have a seat at the table, you're not really gonna make a change to the food system, right? Which is this, this, this massive thing, it's kind of like the Titanic, a big ship with a small rudder that, you know, it, it, it's, it's really daunting as a startup to figure out how do I, how do I challenge an existing system with so many large incumbents, right? Limited resources, limited people. Um, and I think that's where you need to create something exciting and inherently different by its nature and virtue, right? To, to build that trust uh, with the consumer. Um, because for me, like 1909, I, I think you said, like I would love to be around as take two foods, plant-based foods 100 years from now. Uh, it would be such an interesting story on that journey, and, and to, to last that long, it, it takes it takes skill and tenacity um, and, a, and a vision and dream. And so, you know, I think for us, you know, we we had to be visionary. No one asked us for barley milk. No one was waiting for another milk. I think it was confusing enough if you go to the aisles and um, you know the comedians say like, "What haven't we milked yet?" Um, like. Uh, but for us, like, yeah, we, I think from a sustainability and nutrition, we felt it was compelling and different. And, you know, I've made my ice creams, I've made my yogurts, I've, I've made protein shakes. They're all amazing and taste great. You know, our current journey with milk is going to get us, you know, really far along with, you know, upcycling this billions of pounds of barley. But, um, yeah, I mean, the question for us is what's next? And, you know, as we create these opportunities uh, with partnerships, with the community, uh, as food technology continues to evolve and, and, and do things in ways that could not have been conceivable, you know, just a few years ago, um, you know, how do you stay on the cutting edge and how do you, how do you, how do you maintain your relevance as a brand uh, with the history, but with that forward looking thinking that, you know, we can do better? Uh, so I, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, it, for us too, thinking about you know not just um, new product innovation and disruption, but disruption into new markets. And you know, so Tillamook, when I joined a little over six years ago, I remember looking at some of the data and thinking, oh my God, this is the Tillamook twilight zone. Like you know, 85% of households in Oregon and Washington have purchased some Tillamook item over the course of a year. 
that's insane. So I came from Nielsen, where I worked with you know very large CPG companies, um, Nestle, General Mills, Clorox, Del Monte. I mean, those were clients that I would interact with. They would kill for household penetration numbers like that. I mean, that we're right up there with toilet paper. Um, of, you know, how many people <laughs> have purchased Tillamook over the course of a year? So then it's okay. What is it? What is it? What can we export? Because um, we feel like there's something here. We feel like we can bring um, better tasting dairy, um, quality made dairy, um, to areas outside of the Pacific Northwest. So as we started to think about kind of that disruption, you know, my team's job was really okay. What is that secret sauce? Um, what is what's going on in the Tillamook Twilight Zone? We coined it the TTZ. Um, so what's going on in the TTZ that we can bottle up and export elsewhere? Um, you know, that's, <laughs> I remember being in focus groups um, in Texas and a woman said, well, what's a Tillamook? And for me, it was, you know, six months after I started and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is the, the journey before us is I have to convince people or, you know, educate people on what, what is a Tillamook? Um, it's a brand, it's a place, it's, a, you know, all of this sort of equities that we know um, we're trying to sort of bring um, you know, and now one in four households across the United States have some Tillamook item in their home uh, over the course of a year. That's remarkable growth, remarkable, um, you know, kind of expansion of this mission that was started um, many, many years ago in Tillamook. Um, but for us, it's really been, you know, what is, what's going to be resonant with, um, with that household in Atlanta? What's going to be resonant with, um, you know, that household in Jacksonville, Florida, that's true to us, true to, you know, our ethos, um, all of our equities that we've worked so hard to build, um, but that, you know, is going to disrupt a little bit in, you know, the kind of sea of sameness in the dairy category. Um, there's a lot of craft, a lot of Sargento, a lot of private label um, on grocery store shelves across the U.S. So, um, so why? Why would somebody um, reach out for Tillamook um, in that case? So, um, you know, disruption, I think, comes in lots of different sort of shapes and sizes. So what, what do we want to make sure we... Um, is front of pack and what do we want to make sure is uh, in our communication for that initial handshake um, you know is our initial handshake um, should it be product based should it be brand based should it be you know community impact based what what do we need to communicate um, to sort of cut through that sea of sameness um, to again bring bring Tillamook um, and this great tasting um, product um, east of the Mississippi so I think one of the unlocks for us has been, um, who knew that people loved ice cream so much? Um, I think both of you in your intros uh, mentioned ice cream, and this is so true. So we want to talk about the, the hook um, for that initial handshake. Um, shocker to us, and you know, as we look back at kind of the equities that we've built, um, you know, we're Tillamook cheese, and this is you know the two pound baby loaf um, of cheese that everybody has in their refrigerator. We were taking some cheese to some friends in Chicago after we moved, and they said, my God, what do you do with two pounds of cheese? And I'm like, well, you slice it, you shred it, you, you just like snack on it. Of course, what do you do with two pounds of cheese? Um, but it's it's that's true. I mean, in the Tillamook baby loaf, that medium um, cheddar, two pounds, is the number one selling cheese skew in the United States of America. That's insane to know that in a large part of that is driven by the Pacific Northwest and this Tillamook Twilight Zone effect. So um, again, this, dis this disruption, um, one of those unlocks for us has been the power of ice cream, the power of joy, um, and the power of, you know, in those moments of um, we want to have celebration, we want to, you know, get together and, and enjoy um, things with our family. Ice cream um, has been an amazing unlock um, for us. And the other thing has been um, <laughs> the ice cream cooler. If we can get a full door of beautiful, colorful ice cream packaging, that stops, you know, you're walking down the aisle, that stops you. If you walk down the cheese aisle, it's orange, 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 like, you know, where do you sort of sort through that? So I think those have been some um, some unlocks for us of joy and you know disruption at shelf um, being sort of keys uh, for how how we bottle up and then export this uh, the specialness of the brand. But um, I am curious, Matt, if you want to talk a little bit about Canvas. Um, I think sure. that sort of you know disruption from a product perspective and learnings. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so Canvas was our first product with the uh, upcycled grain. It was an interesting one um, because it was basically you're taking the, the whole grain, uh, grinding up, fermenting it, uh, which had some interesting qualities. So one, super high in fiber. There's a huge fiber deficit in the American diet. It leads to a lot of health issues, actually, and people are just unaware of it. Uh, so we wanted to be fiber forward at that point in time. And then also, we use it a lactic acid fermentation, which <laughs> imparted a lot of sourness, think of like a yogurt, yogurty type sourness. And but we, you know, we're on a mission as entrepreneurs not to be, you know, deterred. And so we we crafted this into this fiber and protein shake, and it was sort of our, our first attempt to get into this RTD plant-based beverage space. Uh, and they're not 
there's still not that many players in that space today, but that was really, you know, going back to earlier on innovation and consumer focused innovation is, you know, we're a little ahead of the curve. We're talking about upcycling, uh, you know, four years ago and, and upcycling was back then was cool for clothes or shoes or, or, or apparel but it was not good for food. So when you have a conversation about, hey, I'm making a food from upcycle ingredients and like, what am I eating here? Am I, am I eating trash? <laughs> like, um, and so it was like this like really interesting, like how do, what is the hook to engage consumers in the dialogue? Because once you start talking about the journey and that we're saving the grain and we're moving it up in the food chain and repurposing it and all the health and you know, uh, attributes that go along with a plant-based diet, uh, you know, you could get 13 grams of fiber in one 12 ounce serving. <laughs> so maybe we pushed the fiber envelope just a little too much. But, uh, you know, just being in the space actually was le led to the, some of those insights. It's like, you know, there is true demand for sustainable products, for healthy products, right? Plant-based is here and growing. And, you know, that was four years ago. And today you see how that played out. Uh, but we also had to be, you know, unbiased. Like, it, it wasn't going to be the product that's going to move 8 billion pounds of grain. Like, I'm not going to sell 8 billion fiber shakes, uh, no matter how motivated I am. And so we had to, you know, necessarily take a pause and say, you know what, we still believe in our mission. We still believe in the opportunity. Uh, we still have all this food going to waste. But then how can we recraft that uh, into, into something more compelling? Um, and that's really, you know, that moment where, you know, maybe, you know, Canvas failed, I guess. You know, we, we it, it, it's run out of, you know, it served its purpose. But in doing that, in, in that sort of journey, it opened the door to a new opportunity that was much bigger. Um, and then now, like, yeah, it's just an amazing platform and it can continue to grow. And so, you know, for, for me, it's just been, you know, this continuous learning journey. You know, you can't go into this with blinders. You have to be receptive to feedback. There's, you have your own biases. Uh, you have to talk to the consumers. You can't do it within your own four walls. A lot of this seems obvious <laughs> in hindsight, but, you know, the reality is it's, it's really easy to get focused on your one slice, right? You know, the, there's so much waste in the food system. You know, it's, it's on par. When you look at the, the environmental impact of food waste, it's the same as transportation, <laughs> right? Which is mind boggling, like there's literally food, 30% of the food, I believe, the last statistic I saw, goes to waste. Uh, and trying to save that is noble, but you can't boil the ocean either. Like, you need to focus on your slice of it. Like, what am I going to do today that's going to have less food go to waste tomorrow, right? And ours, our answer to that slice of the problem was, was upcycled barley and upcycling. And so for me, um, yeah, it's just you need to be flexible. Uh, the world's changing rapidly. We all know this. We're all wearing masks today, uh, whereas you know two years ago we weren't. Uh, so we need to necessarily adapt. But I think when we you know forward looking, um, you know when we want to be innovators, we want to be entrepreneurs. We we want to be around for another hundred years. Um, you know it's going to have to be uh, you know collaborative, open thinking in order to achieve that. Yeah, I love that. And I think the, the fail fast, uh, learn from it. You know, we talk about being a 110-year-old startup um, in so many ways of, you know, how are we um, creating a culture where our employees know, you know, yeah, you, you're expected to push the envelope. You can fail fast, learn from it. There will be sort of that safety, um, you know, psychological safety, job security safety. Like, this is, this is part of it because, you know, as Patrick, our CEO, says, if we're not failing, we're not pushing hard enough. So, um, and I love that, you know, to hear, to hear him um, not just say it, but reinforce, you know, if everything that we launch in market is a success, it means we haven't pushed it hard enough. Like, we should expect some failures, failures in market. Um, and we should, you know, do that as quickly as possible, learn from it, um, incorporate those learnings moving forward. And, um, yeah, everyone's uh, still around for the next day. So, <laughs> you know, which makes it, again, I, you hear it, though, you know, organizations where that, you know, failure is not an option and that sort of that safety, I think, um, hasn't been created. So it keeps, um, it really restricts growth. So. Yeah, I've definitely had my great successes built on the back of failures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you can't be a scientist or an entrepreneur and not sort of just be able to, to, to run with that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I love like progress over perfection. So how do we, you know, in a sustainability journey and innovation um, and just, you know, building a brand, um, how do we sort of view those kind of little steps um, as progress towards something, but uh, not hold ourselves accountable to, to perfection, certainly, so. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if any other uh, questions or topics or anything for us, so. 
No, we still have five minutes, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, branding. I, branding's an interesting one. Um, one of the challenges with, with Take Two is we had to simultaneously create a brand and a category, right? So for us, you know, it was almost felt like double the effort. Uh, whereas, you know, we didn't have any brand equity or household penetration or whatever metric you want to use. Um, you know, we had to start from scratch. And honestly, we had to do it at a pretty difficult time. We launched our product in March of 2020 <laughs> here locally. Uh, not a great time to, to launch a product right before a pandemic starts. Um, but I think, yeah, branding uh, for us is turning out to be, you know, really key. I mean, I, as you know, like, um, consumers love their brands. Right, they, they trust their brands, they expect their brands to be leaders in the space. And, uh, you know, so for Take Two, we, we continuously to try to push the envelope on the brand and define what it should be. And we're still, we're still in that early, you know, infancy of that journey. Uh, but yeah, from, from Tillamook, I'd love to understand, like, you know, how you're managing your brand and, and carrying that brand and, and reshaping that going forward. Yeah, I mean, I was told very early on uh, our brand is the most important equity. Uh, so don't screw it up. <laughs> so that message received, message internalized. Um, but I think you know what the what consumers think about brands, the role of brands is massively evolving. So we can't rest on the laurels of you know the the equity that we've built. We can't rest on the laurels of yeah you know 85% household penetration. You know great great for us. People know us. They get us. They can go to the coast. They can smell the cows. They can you know see the creamery. They can get their ice cream um, and really experience that that kind of full brand ethos. Um, Consumers, you know, are much more in tune with what product attributes, kind of redefining the value of what is premium. Um, and so it's not just, you know, you've built up this brand equity and you can sort of write it. The bar keeps getting higher and higher. And so how are we thinking about, you know, always being true to our North Star? I mentioned our, you know, six uh, stewardship stakeholders. Those are sort of key to make sure that we're not letting the tail wag the dog of, you know, this is what consumers tell us is important, so this is what we're going to say. You no, know, we have we have our North Star. We have that, um, you know, kind of the, the center of our being um, driving these decisions. But um, it's really how do we make sure that we're showing up in relevant ways? Um, what what story um, do we want to tell? Is, are we going to um, sort of communicate in a certain context or a certain moment to consumers? Because um, we have so many stories that we can tell. So I think that's for us the challenge of um, you know, always staying true to our brand, but just making sure that we're showing up in those relevant moments to um, yeah, get that kapow communicated so that you know, even if somebody never walks into the, um, into the Tillamook Creamery um, you know, is, uh, and experiences that ice cream experience, which is amazing, um, we do the full kind of knife cut through the um, you know, 48 ounces of ice cream and you watch, watch it sort of unfold and see all the beautiful uh, variegates and so forth in it. That's a limited experience for the number of consumers that we're going to touch. So how do we make sure that kind of that ethos of the Tillamook way, um, you know, we're doing right by all of our um, stewardship um, stakeholders, we're doing right by food, we're doing right by communities, we're doing right by the future, not just our future, but the future of farming, the future of agriculture in general. So, you know, we think a lot about partnerships. You mentioned partnerships, Matt, of, you know, partner partnering with um, American Farmland Trust. So how do we align with these organizations that are on a kind of broader mission um, that we can, you know, contribute to in some way, um, be a voice for good, a voice for um, kind of this mission that we're all on together to make sure that um, farming is around. You know, we're all in on cows. Uh, we're all in on um, animal-based agriculture. So how do we make sure that we're, that we're doing right by the future of that, making sure that, um, you know, limiting the impact on the environment, limiting, um, making sure healthful cows um, are a part of all animal al agriculture, that those um, best practices in farming are incorporated. So all those things are central to our brand and, again, our ethos. Um, whether consumers are saying, you know, which brand is kind of best for this, they don't, um, but we need to make sure that we're showing that um, and then they're tasting it. Uh, I mentioned the focus group in Texas, that same group, she said, oh, you can taste the quality. So you know this, you know, this brand is not, she used some, I'll, I'll say the expletive, but um, you know, they, this isn't a, a crappy brand um, because you can taste the quality and I think it's those attributes, those quality things that come through and that's, that's right, that's what the, what the brand should mean because um, if we're doing all that stuff, um, you know, we're not just talking to ourselves, consumers can actually experience the difference. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take these last few moments. Um, and uh, I really just want to thank the, the community here. Um, like Oregon has an amazing food entrepreneurship community. It's very receptive. 
we all know that you know sustainability is imperative that we, we need to implement change at a massive scale and you can't do that by yourself so really having a community that can take these ideas and these sparks of genius and really you know nurture those to create compelling products um, it's just been amazing so I just you know thank everyone for for providing such a space to, to give it a shot awesome yeah thank you